Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Wonderful. And we can hear you very well. Good. Everyone in the room can. Okay. Now you tell me how you want to handle this. Do you want to go through the questions or just enter into a general conversation, uh, first of all, and then see which questions you want answered? Why don't we start with you just making um, a general statement and uh, briefly sharing your story with us, and then we'll dive yes. into the questions that you haven't addressed after that. Okay. Um, I think the first thing I'd want to tell you a little bit about is, is the, what the Church of Ireland is, uh, the kind of essence of the kind of church that it is, uh, and therefore the kind of church for which we're providing uh, worship materials. So the Church of Ireland uh, was at one time part of the United Church of England and Ireland, and it was an established church. Uh, so therefore, all the old ancient buildings that go back to the time of St. Patrick and his followers, for example, are all in the hands of the Church of Ireland. But it was an established church which never had the majority of the population, perhaps uh, the only one in the world. Uh, there may be others, but I can't think of them. Uh, where it was only a minority church, but nevertheless the establishment. Uh, and it was disestablished from the, uh, from the Church of England, separated from the Church of England in 1869 to 1870. So it then, at, from that point onwards, was able to run its own affairs. And it ran its own affairs really through the medium of uh, a general synod. And the general synod uh, would be a group with uh, one third clergy, two thirds lay people on the House of Representatives. So there are two lay people for every clergy person. And the House of Bishops, which functions to a degree separately, but actually meets with the House of Representatives. Liturgical revision uh, for the Church of Ireland was part of its early instinct because it was disestablished at the height of uh, ritualism in the Church of England. And uh, it did not wish to go in that direction, at least generally didn't wish to go in that direction. Uh, so it established itself uh, very much as uh, probably a low church the middle of the road kind of uh, Protestant church. Uh, even now in the Republic of Ireland, uh, when you say Protestant, uh, people assume that what you're talking about is Church of Ireland. Uh, the, the, the others would have been called dissenters in the other churches. Uh, so the Church of Ireland uh, now is a church which is only 15% of the population in Northern Ireland, which as you probably know is part of the United Kingdom, and about 3% or 3.5% of the population in the Republic. Um, it, today it would have a, a slightly different profile in the sense that uh, quite a lot of the churches in the Republic would probably be more defined as kind of liberal Catholic uh, and the largest proportion of the churches in the north would probably be defined as low church evangelical. That's not true across the board, but it's the kind of, uh, kind of context in which we're working. And in, in, uh, tell me when you get tired listening to me, by the way, and just put your wave and I'll stop. Uh, the, in 1870, uh, one of the first tasks of the new General Synod was actually to revise the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, it had to be revised in a new context, uh, but it was also revised through many uh, agreements and disagreements, uh, some of which were to do with the traditional issues of, uh, as it were, high church and low church. So there were many debates, for example, on things like baptismal regeneration 
and what that meant and uh, how it should be expressed or not expressed liturgically. Uh, there were debates on uh, prayers for the departed, uh, Eucharistic doctrine, and so forth. And the other thing that you probably need to know from a perspective of listening from the States uh, is that the roots, therefore, of the Church of Ireland were in the, in the tradition of the 1662 Book of Common Prayer, not the 1637 Book of Common Prayer, which you inherited, of course, uh, through Scotland. Uh, so th those were the, the liturgical roots were there, though interestingly, legally, the 1552 Book of Common Prayer was never legal currency in Ireland, just through a political quirk. Uh, but our roots were 1662. Uh, the Church of England was not able to change the 1662 Book of Common Prayer because it was part, uh, it was a law. And they still aren't able to change the 1662 Book of Common Prayer unless by an act of parliament. But once the Church of Ireland was disestablished in 1869-70, uh, it was free to amend the Book of Common Prayer in any ways that it wished. And it only did in the most minor of ways, really, uh, and created a new Book of Common Prayer in 1878. Now... What happened uh, then was that another set of changes came in in 1926. And they came in because, largely because of the political rearrangements in the country. So you couldn't pray, oh, God save the king anymore because they didn't have the king in the southern part of the country. You had to create... Uh, uh, rubrics and uh, responses and prayers that were suitable for a new political environment. And uh, that happened in really in 1926. And then other services were added in the 1930s, like Compline and things like that. Uh, so really, we had a Book of Common Prayer that was incrementally changing, but in a very small kind of way. Uh, through its history from 1878 onwards. So it wasn't unusual for the General Synod to be dealing with prayer book revision. Uh, that had been part of its instinct and part of its job from the very beginning. Uh, because the prayer book revision was so sensitive, uh, with the prayer book being the carrier of doctrine, along with the 39 articles, obviously, but because it was so sensitive, the legislation for prayer book revision uh, in the Synod was uh, more like doctrinal legislation. Uh, we have a general synod every year. That's a very different thing to your situation with the general convention. Uh, so what has to happen in our context is that a resolution is brought to the synod in the first year uh, which lays before the Synod the, uh, the text, basically, that it's intended to bring as a bill the next year. It's a parliamentary procedure that we have. So the resolution goes one year, and people can speak to that, comment on it. Uh, they can send in potential resolutions. Uh, they send them into the Liturgical Advisory Committee, it decides whether to back the resolution, the, the re amendments rather, or not, and uh, then comes back to the next year's synod uh, with a bill, and uh, people uh, then go through stages of a bill. There are three stages of the bill, so it's scrutinized in a lot of different ways before it actually becomes legislation. And uh, that's the process that had to happen uh, with the revision of the Book of Common Prayer for all the services. It had to go as a resolution with potential amendments. It had to go through three stages as a bill, and it comes out the other end uh, probably very highly scrutinized, though sometimes there are things that are missed as well. So that will probably be different to your legislation. 
Now, <laughs> the, the other aspect of the revision that you've shown an interest in was hymnody and the church hymnal, because uh, the Episcopal Church and the Church of Ireland are similar <clears throat> in that they have authorized hymnody. Uh, the Church of England, for example, does not have authorized hymnody. Everybody just creates their own hymn books for different strands in the church, uh, nor does, I think, the Church of Scot Episcopal Church in Scotland or the Church of in Wales don't have authorized hymnody, but we do. Uh, it doesn't mean we're limited to that, but it means it provides a base point. Uh, and since the, really, since the middle of the 19th century, when hymnody was taking off in churches, uh, we have had church hymnals. And the one that we have at the moment is the fifth edition of the church hymnal. And the general uh, process through which, or the stages through which that goes, usually is that you have a church hymnal in use for a number of years. In the case of the, the present one, it was 30 years. It was written in, the one before the last one, rather, written in 1960. Uh, in 1990, a supplement was brought out uh, that was only intended to be for a short period to test the waters. Uh, and that supplement made people aware of the large amount of new hymn writing that had taken place since the 1970s. Uh, and people began to say, well, our hymn book has become a bit dated. It's a bit kind of classical rather than popular, as it were. Uh, and we need to look at that and change it. So in the year 2000, by a separate process through a hymn book committee, uh, but in the year 2000, uh, the fifth edition of the church hymnal came out. And now, just uh, this past year, a supplement to that called Thanks and Praise in 2015 uh, was brought out uh, with 200. Hundred and seventeen, I think it is, two to two twenty-seven items um, <clears throat> to supplement it, and it's already feeling as though we're going through the same general process again. A hymn book that provides the foundation, other new writing, uh, trying to guess which of those things will become classics and which are only temporary. Uh, and where we needed to supplement the material in the church hymnal. Uh, and then that probably will lead to another process in 10 or so years' time uh, where people will say, well, let's update it all again. So those are the two strands. Uh, the liturgical material uh, has been very, very much uh, checked and supervised because of its doctrinal component. Uh, and its doctrinal role in Anglicanism of the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, the, uh, the hymn book material this time was not as much scrutinized. People were given a list of the hymns and printouts, as it were, to look at. I want you to keep going. To check that there was anything, nothing on toward in it or whatever. Or they were happy with it. <laughs> uh, it's not as highly scrutinized as the liturgical material. Are you bored listening to me, or do you want me to continue? Okay. Okay, I'll keep on then, and you can ask questions. Okay. Uh, so so I, I've been involved in both these processes. Uh, the church hymnal was developed by a, a hymnal committee set up by the General Synod in the year 1993, I think it is. Uh, and came into being in the year 2000. It was a separate strand. And you ask, why did it come first? Just because it came to people's attention first that it was necessary. It wasn't really planned. And uh, it came out in the year 2000. Um, the, the prayer book process, that was not done through the Liturgical Advisory Committee, but the supplement was because it was remitted to the Liturgical Advisory Committee by the Synod, the role of 
keeping an eye on the development of hymnody as well, rather than keeping in place uh, the hymn book committee. So th this hymn book took about seven years to come to fruition. I don't know how long it takes in the States, but that's the length of time it took here. And the Book of Common Prayer, <laughs> the Book of Common Prayer uh, 2004 also took about seven years to come to fruition. And I, I would plan to tell you about the background of it, if that would be okay. Is that okay? Yeah? Oh, okay. So the Liturgical Advisory Committee was set up, I think, in 1965. Uh, at the time of liturgical renewal. Up to 1965, in my own experience in the Church of Ireland, and I think it was a, a ubiquitous experience, uh, you didn't have anything used in worship in churches except what was in the Book of Common Prayer, which is essentially the revised version of 1662. Nobody really thought of doing anything different to that. Uh, the liturgical renewal movement had not really permeated here, or indeed England either, uh, until that time. Uh, and at the same kind of time in England and Ireland, uh, there became a particular interest in uh, liturgical renewal. And I suppose most of that initially was related to Eucharistic renewal, uh, the structure of the Eucharistic rite. Uh, and Dom Gregory Dix and all the rest of it in the shape of the liturgy and uh, realizing that the rite that we had in 1662 was, let's put it like this, slightly quirky in comparison to ecumenical rites. So in 1965, uh, the Liturgical Advisory Committee was set up. Uh, it was set up with a careful balance of different uh, views and churchmanships and things like that. Um, and the first thing that it issued was in 1969, a new rite for Holy Communion, which was in a booklet. I think this happened in many places. And the, the rite for Holy Communion at that time was what I would call a revised standard version rite. <laughs> Because God was still called thee and thou, and people were called you. And the shape of it changed, and the peace was introduced into it, but it was introduced as a kind of Cheshire cat peace, if you know what I mean by that. You didn't shake anybody's hands. You just said the words, the peace of the Lord be always with you, and then went on with things uh, as though nobody else was there, really. Um, so, so that was in 1969. Then in 1972, uh, another Eucharistic rite came out, which was all U-form liturgy and developed things like sharing the peace and things like that. Uh, and then uh, there was another important development in 1969, actually. It was the first, the first service in U language in relation to God in the Church of Ireland was a service for baptism. And at that time, that meant infant baptism largely. Uh, and that was issued as the first service that ever had God addressed as you. Uh, it became extremely popular. In fact, the old baptismal service was hardly seen from that point onwards because the new one was so much more accessible for people. And then out of all of that, uh, came eventually in 1984, the Alternative Prayer Book. I don't know whether you have a copy of that there, but the Alternative Prayer Book was modelled to some degree on the Church of England Alternative Services Book, which had come out four years earlier. And I think if I'm being really honest about liturgical revision in the Church of Ireland, what we have generally done is taken liturgical revision in the Church of England just across the water and slightly conservatized it. That has been the model that we have had for most of our liturgical revision, to take the hard work that's done by the much larger uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, mother church almost, even though we go back longer with St. Patrick, don't forget that, but uh, that we've taken the work done by, by the by the larger church 
but with all its expert lit liturgists and theologians and modified it and simplified it uh, generally. And that was what happened in the alternative uh, prayer book. And the alternative prayer book was essentially a Sunday service book. It didn't really provide for things like uh, marriages and ordinations and occasional services and things like that, funerals. It was essentially a Sunday service book, uh, which had within it a, a rather strange lectionary that came from the Joint Liturgical Group in England with themes in it at that time. Uh, and it, it, it was received in a variety of different ways. Um, it was gen very popular where it was popular and very unpopular where they didn't like it. Uh, so that you had the alternative service book, a prayer book with new form services, everything, new structures and so forth for Sunday services. Uh, but there would have been people, for example, in this part of the country, which would have seen it as a kind of Romanizing trend. Uh, and did not accept it very warmly at all. Uh, in fact, uh, the Orange Order would have uh, denounced it and all sorts of things as being absolutely the wrong direction. So what the Alternative Prayer Book did in 1984 uh, was created uh, a certain amount of division in the church. You became known as a church that used the Book of Common Prayer or the Alternative Prayer Book. Uh, and uh, the, the move then, well, uh, an alternative occasional services book was brought out as well to cover the other liturgies. Uh, and the move in the middle of the 1990s was to coordinate these things, to bring them together under one cover uh, so that there would be, in the kind of way that you have in your church, so that there would be one book with traditional and contemporary uh, language services. That was the move. Uh, there were very interesting times in the Synod. Uh, we, uh, the idea was mooted, first of all, of a Sunday service book. Um, and the Sunday service book failed to get through the Synod, I think because people wanted everything together under one cover. Uh, so that the direction we began to take in 1997, when the Liturgical Advisory Committee was asked to progress towards uh, a revised Book of Common Prayer, uh, the direction we took then was really a direction of unifying things. Uh, so w our idea was really that, that everything in the book should be usable by everybody. Uh, we didn't want contentious things that were going to divide the church in the book. We wanted a unifying book of common prayer. And we also chose the model, again, as you have chosen up to this point, we also chose the model of a book that wasn't just there for Sundays, but a book that was there to form people's spirituality and form their lives uh, in the way in which the, the old book of common prayer hopefully did uh, by, by taking the key things, the key points in life and providing uh, lectionaries for every day of the year and so forth, it was meant to be a book that was there uh, that, that held together the devotional, the public, uh, the, the, the private and so forth uh, in under one cover in a simple kind of way. The Church of England at that point went in entirely the opposite direction and produce common worship, which has got so many books that you'd be <laughs> hard pressed to find what you're looking for. Uh, and uh, at, they said at the time of the Reformation, at the time of Cranmer, it, with the, the old pie, that it sometimes took people longer to find the service than actually to pray it. Uh, and the Church of England has generally gone Thank in that you. direction. Um, and uh, we have generally I'm gone in the other direction. The, and that probably is one of the questions that you'll yet. be asking um, yourselves. We do have so is that, do, do you want to fire uh, some other process, questions just to stop me talking for a in while? In terms of managing 
the work and actually writing liturgies, drafting and revising drafts and all of that. Yes. 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 Um, okay. Um, well, let me come at it again, slightly taking a step back. Uh, two of the things that were given for us uh, were essentially the work of the International Anglican Liturgical Commission, uh, which had been working on the uh, Lima document on the BEM, Baptism, Eucharist and Ministry. Uh, and indeed, maybe I've met some of you at some of those uh, liturgical commissions. Uh, and those commissions set out essentially uh, well, a shape for liturgy, a shape for the baptismal liturgy, a shape for the Eucharistic liturgy, a shape for ordination liturgies. So from a very early stage, uh, we took the essential principles of the liturgical commissions. For example, it meant that the Eucharistic liturgy was essentially the gathering of God's people, followed by the proclaiming and receiving of the word, followed by the prayers of the people, followed by uh, celebrating at the Lord's table, followed by going out to serve the Lord and so forth. Um, so we took those as starting points for the key liturgies um, and uh, people would have gone away, different groups of people would have gone away and done a first draft and uh, the first draft was then um, mulled over. Uh, I did the first draft of the, ordina draft of the ordination uh, liturgies and I think it would be true to say, unless anyone can correct me, that the Church of Ireland was the first church in the communion to take the IALC structure and apply it uh, in a reasonably thoroughgoing way to ordination uh, liturgy. So, and again, with baptismal liturgy, uh, we, we tried to ensure that baptism is baptism is baptism uh, and that there is not one doctrine for infant baptism and another doctrine for adult baptism or whatever. Uh, so that was one starting point that was a given. Uh, the second starting point that was a given was uh, the elk texts. Uh, so that, that the liturgical <coughs> advisory committee made a, a call uh, that the English language uh, consultation texts, liturgical consultation texts, that were at that stage uh, had become more ecumenically agreed, though that has all fallen apart since, uh, that, that we would basically use in what is a, an ecumenical environment, we would use the same words for the Sanctus as the Roman Catholic Church was using at that time and so forth, uh, which were the ecumenically agreed texts. Um, and in most cases, that, that was applied in a thoroughgoing way, uh, in one case, it wasn't, at least one case, and the one case was the Lord's Prayer, where um, the Synod of the Church of Ireland could not cope with being saved from the time of trial uh, and were concerned to be like the Church of England, led into temptation or not. Uh, so uh, that was voted down at the General Synod, even with all the best theological arguments in the world. Uh, they wanted to keep with uh, the Church of England on that one and did. So those were two starting points. Uh, and then obviously the, the list of services that had to go into the book were, um, were gathered together. Uh, the Psalter was taken from the new Church of England, Common Worship Psalter. Before that, we had been using the David Frost Psalter uh, and it was not very popular, uh, so that we decided on one psalter for both traditional and uh, contemporary services, uh, though people can still, if they wish, use the old one. Uh, but this was so resonant of the, uh, the words in the old one anyway that people probably haven't noticed a great deal of difference, and it 
seems to have worked well. Uh, and then the other decision that had been made in the 1990s uh, was to run with the revised common lectionary. So those things were all in place. Uh, groups went away, devised services, and we had lots of overnight meetings and so forth. And uh, uh, then uh, we, we yeah. kind of uh, worked on them and presented them as resolutions and bills to the Synod. And they were, you know, some battles and things like that, but not major ones. Uh, with the hymn book, just I don't know. Are you interested in the hymn book as well? Yeah. Uh, yeah. With, with, the, with, with the hymn book, uh, we did, uh, first of all, we surveyed the church uh, to find out which hymns in the old book were being used and which hymns were not being used. Uh, uh, that was a starting point for us. It wasn't an end point because some of the ones that weren't being used, we might have considered classical hymns that needed to be in any good uh, hymnody, even if they're only rarely used. Uh, and then we surveyed people for hymns that they would like to see in the hymn book. And uh, very interestingly, the two top ones, if I remember correctly, were uh, symbolized uh, the gulf that had grown up. The first, the most popular one was the old rugged cross. And the second most popular one was Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. And I think what it said was that we had had a very classic kind of hymnody, uh, which people liked, but it didn't always have the hymns that really were in people's memories or touched their hearts. Uh, and uh, the church had somehow a distinction had grown up. So we, we looked at those and we eventually worked through a process of whittling things down and uh, agreeing what other new texts would go in. Um, we had an issue which uh, you have had as well in North America, uh, and it's the issue of whether to use in hymnody and in liturgy uh, what would have been called inclusive language. Um, and our decision in the, in the hymn book was that if a hymn was very fixed in people's we, memory, we, we would generally not change it. Uh, but if it wasn't, if it was in the second category of well-known but not absolutely fixed, uh, we would... Uh, can you hear me? I'm not moving on the screen all of a sudden, but it's okay. Uh, if, it, if it wasn't... That's okay. So that uh, if it was well known but not fixed and we could easily and seamlessly change to inclusive language about people, we would do that. But we decided both in the hymnody and in the uh, liturgy not to change language about God unless it was an elk text, basically. Uh, and in that case, we did. Um, and I have to say that still 15, 16 years after the hymn book coming out, <laughs> we are still getting many complaints about some of the hymns that we tinkered with, like Be Thou My Vision, for example, is a very popular one. I'm one the hymn that I'm most sick of singing, to be quite honest with you, but uh, uh, thou, uh, thou My True Heir instead of Son, you know, uh, that really grits with people here after 16 years. It hasn't even, hasn't died down. And Christmas carols with words changed grit with people after 16 years as well. So in thanks and we praise have, uh, in, the, in, the, in the new one, uh, in the supplement, uh, we, we decided not to tinker uh, with old hymns uh, in terms of making them inclusive the again, the unless it was very easily like done, uh, almost not noticed, really. Now, I don't know. That. Keep firing questions, <laughs> Drew. Yes. Uh, no, I don't think we... I have no memory of us doing that kind of surveying with the prayer book because, in a sense, from 1969, when the first service was issued in a booklet form 
1993 when alternative occasional services were issued, uh, uh, th those were all part of testing the water. But there's another side to it as well. <clears throat> we have uh, the possibility of experimental liturgical uh, material, which is agreed by the House of Bishops, usually for a period of seven years, uh, with the intention of uh, people experimenting to see how it goes and then gathering information about it. So that one of the things we're doing that with at the moment, uh, reviewing, is to do with Holy Communion by extension. Uh, so the, the, the bishops can issue services with experimental legislation uh, for a period of time where everyone is free to experiment with those services. I mean, one of the things we're doing at this moment in time is creating what's, what we're calling Morning Prayer 3, which would be a kind of largely based, actually, on common worship. It would be a form of prayer for Sunday mornings, because most of our churches do not have a weekly Eucharist. So the, the general service is either morning prayer or a service of the word. Uh, <clears throat> so that what we're doing is creating one with a kind of benedictions, responsories, things like that, enriched with more poetic language, probably seasonal material uh, for morning prayer. And uh, we, that may well be the case that that would be the bishop would say, well, we will um, issue that as an experimental service, but it can only be issued uh, with the agreement that it comes to the synod, at, usually after seven years. Yes. Um, <coughs> well, it's very difficult to navigate doctrinal disagreements. Uh, I mean, when when you read the Church of Ireland Book of Common Prayer um, from the perspective of a church that was rooted in 1637, you will probably say, well, there isn't really an epiclesis on the bread and wine. And that's true. There isn't. Uh, the epiclesis is on the people through the receiving of the, the bread and wine. Uh, with language, I mean, the, the doctrinal disagreements in our context would be largely the traditional ones uh, that are, are kind of Catholic evangelical disagreements. But we did find a way through it in the sense that everybody seems happy to use what we've got. Uh, the question is whether you're trying to create a liturgy that's a unifying thing or, or whether you're trying to create different liturgies for different for groups how many of people. Of your parishes use and we the, found that that wasn't, um, uh, the even though it was, we didn't intend right it, that was what happened for a period and it service. wasn't a very healthy place to be, really. Yes, I, I would. Yes, uh, the the use of the use of right of the con traditional right, uh, morning prayer one, would be very limited, very limited, and Holy Communion one very limited. Um, usually, uh, in ca the case of morning or evening prayer one, churches that have a choral tradition, uh, and they want to do choral even song or choral matins or whatever it may be. Um, but, I mean, in my own diocese, I, I was, felt rather sad for an old man in his 90s who told me that the, his church had stopped using it and where could he find it? And uh, I felt, was really uh, stretched to think of anywhere that he could find it. Now, there are one or two places, uh, but really it would be very, very uncommon. Uh, the Holy Communion won would not be as uncommon because it would often <clears throat> be the preferred rite for early communions or midweek communions where most of the people are older people who are present. So you'd get Holy Communion one more often than you'd get morning 
our evening prayer one, and you would hardly ever get holy baptism one, and you would never find ordination one. Uh, so they are there in the book. Another question. And um, they're there probably doctrine. for largely Again, um, doctrinal were there reasons. Any significant and historical changes in doctrine in the shift from traditional the old reasons, to the new books? But they're and not actually so really very widely used. Um, well, that depends on how you look at it. Um, I think it would be true to say that any change in liturgy is automatically to some degree a change in doctrine, uh, in the sense that, for example, uh, if you take, um, if you take uh, Cranmer's communion service, um, uh, Cranmer's communion service is really essentially focused in a rather individualistic kind of way, uh, but a very helpful way on being an exposition probably of the doctrine of justification by grace through faith. Uh, it, it, it's not a very corporate kind of service, um, uh, whereas the, the new communion service invites you to see Holy Communion uh, uh, as a more corporate kind of event. And that's where things like the peace come in. Um, and, and also a more Eucharistic kind of event, uh, rather than a, as penitential a, a communion service as Cranmer's one is. Uh, so you do change uh, the, the, maybe the weighting of different uh, aspects of doctrine uh, unwittingly. Uh, when you move away from the old general confession, uh, you, you actually can make sin seem formulistic rather than emotional or rather than uh, something that you, when you speak out the old general confessions, you're aware of the depth of sin and you're aware of how you maybe are, you should be feeling about it. Uh, in, in the new services, you go through it as a kind of formulistic kind of way, uh, maybe lacking in poetry in some cases and uh, Therefore, the, 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 weight, the weight can be different, but it was, I mean, when the prayer book is a book of doctrine and a book used know, to show and prove we're, we're doctrine interested as well, also about, um, uh, there would have been a concern issues that we didn't move away um, from any essential you know, doctrinal to, understanding. Uh, the English language. It's a good picture. It's a good picture. Yes, yes. Yes. Um, sorry you're having to look at just a, a frozen picture of myself, but uh, I'll talk away. Um, okay, there is... Hmm? It's a good picture, yes. There, there is... Uh, <laughs> Uh, th there's a, a group in Ireland called, uh, you don't have to write this down, Common Gaelic na Hoglisha, uh, which is the Irish, uh, an Irish church group uh, promoting the use of the Irish language uh, in liturgy. So there is an Irish language version of the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, and there are Irish language hymns in the hymn book and in the supplement as well. Uh, now, as you may know, uh, Irish is not a very commonly spoken language in Ireland in the way that Welsh is in Wales. But nevertheless, especially in the Republic, there are a lot of people who learn Irish from childhood and who like to be able to say certain prayers in Irish or occasionally go to, uh, go to a service uh, in Irish. And uh, therefore, the essential services, not the whole book, but the essential services have been translated was into it, was the, the translation Irish language that handled as well. The uh, in Northern the Ireland, that wouldn't be used very often, though the Irish another... language book was actually launched in my own cathedral, which is Down Cathedral, where St. Patrick is buried.
No, we wouldn't. No, we no, we wouldn't have been capable of handling the translation into Irish. Um, but uh, no, it was handled by a particular group of Irish speakers and one or two key people. And we have always had one or two archbishops who were fluent in Irish up until now. Uh, so George Sims, who was the Archbishop of Armagh, was fluent in Irish in his day. Donald Caird, who was the Archbishop of Dublin, was fluent in Irish. So we do have some fluent Irish speakers, uh, but uh, no, the, the actual uh, translations was handled by others. And it was really, in all honesty, essentially a translation from the English language into the Irish here. language, whereas some of the hymns in the church hymnal are not like that. They're specifically Irish hymns uh, written in the Irish language uh, uh, and uh, in their own right, as it were. Can you, can you word it? Now, if you're asking it, uh, uh, Dean, uh, Drew, can I just say, if you're asking a different kind question. of question, uh, when you ask about culture and enculturation, um, one of the one one of the uh, one of the issues that you okay, okay, uh, one of the issues that we have. Okay, well that may not have answered everything about enculturation. Um, I, I would observe in the states uh, that most worship forms are quite similar, uh, quite uh, rigidly following liturgical form. Uh, in England and Ireland, uh, we have a, a much wider range of practice than would be evident from looking at the prayer book. Uh, so there is in the Book of Common Prayer, for example, a service of the word. And the service of the word is simply a structure uh, for worship and uh, into which different things can be slotted in an imaginative and creative kind of way. And uh, in some working class areas, for example, in my own diocese, uh, the worship would be much more like that, less bookish, because uh, you, you need worship here anyway for people who are, do not read very many books, you know. And I often say to them, if when Cranmer was developing the Book of Common Prayer, never forget that printing had just been invented uh, and he was at the cutting edge of technology when he was creating a prayer book. Uh, but nowadays, if Cranmer was here, he'd be using PowerPoint or something like that. So I think we have to, you know, get deep into our culture as well, you know. Were there um, cultural groups, cultural groups, um, or racial groups that that were um, part of the process in terms of um, considering their experiences and their culture when you were designing the new prayer book? That might not be as much part of your context. Can you repeat it, through? And and the answer, well, it, it is now, but it wasn't then. Uh, it is now, but it wasn't then. And uh, in truth, just like the Church of England before us, uh, we have not been very good at relating in any kind of meaningful way into new people from new cultures coming to live among us. Thank um, you. Um, so at that particular time in the 1990s, that was and what just your didn't exist of the new very much as an uh, in Ireland, tool. but it's becoming it much more the case now, the and church. I think it would need to be part of any future work. Good. <laughs> oh dear, you're getting me on a pet subject when you ask that question. Um, <laughs> so, excuse me, just a moment. Somebody's got uh, somebody's left their phone here. <laughs> I just let it. 
The, the technician has left his phone. That's, just let that ring off for a moment. <laughs> it's getting worse. Okay. Um, oh. It's gone. In terms of evangelism, I, I, I'd like, I'd like, I'd, you could say preach it, brother. You know, I don't, I'm not sure that it really matters whether a church is highly liturgical, not highly liturgical, high church, low church, middle church, or whatever, in terms of evangelism, so long as the worship is, first of all, real for the people who are there. I think, to me, that's the key thing in evangelism. Uh, and also, so long as it is, um, to some degree, accessible, it doesn't have to be all accessible, I don't think, but I think it does have to be to a degree accessible. Uh, so using uh, a lot of very complex liturgical language uh, with no accessibility, I don't think is very helpful in evangelism, though people will work through it if, the, if there's a reality of faith and experience of God in the community. Um, so I, I kind of... Uh, I don't, I'm not sure how much liturgical shape uh, relates to evangelism, but what I can tell you is this, that our experience would be that the places where there are most young people or young adults are probably the least liturgical of places. And I find that hard to say, though I always tell them that they are liturgical, may not be good liturgy, but there's liturgy there. Uh, but we don't really get a lot of young people who are tickled put. by traditional Anglican liturgy. And the ones who are, are inclined to be older than their years or slightly odd. I can sense that, I can, I can sense, I can sense that you're agreeing. <laughs> You know, let's be honest, most of our traditional churches are in decline. Thankfully, <laughs> well, we'll discover this year whether we're in decline or not. Uh, but most of them are in decline, and most of us have the capability of creating older congregations who have always known the liturgy and liked the liturgy and wonder why everybody else hasn't come to their way of doing it. Uh, you know, and they don't see themselves as having become clubs for old people, but that's actually what's happening. And I'm just talking about in our context. So we're having to create experimental liturgies alongside the traditional ones if we're going to win a new generation. Are you able to hear that or you want me to repeat it? Yes, I know. I heard that. I heard that. Okay. I mean, you know, we're beginning to get get anecdotal at the moment, but um, we have some very interesting, fresh expressions of church in the diocese, and that's probably what I can easiest, most easily talk about. The diocese I'm in uh, is uh, half of the city of Belfast and the surrounding county, basically, of Down. Um, it has got uh, about 80 parochial units. Uh, and now has about five new church plants and several fresh expressions of church. One of the fresh expressions is in an area called the Titanic Quarter, uh, where the Titanic was built, uh, where we have an honesty box cafe in, in a building with a, what's called a meanwhile lease. It meant that nobody really wanted the building when it was built, and it's given free to a charity, uh, we have a cafe there, uh, and today or any other day of the week, 500 people will go through that cafe with a prayer garden in it. It's all very low-key. It's not pushy evangelism or anything like that. Uh, but I also uh, went, did a confirmation two weeks ago in an yeah. area which is very much inner-city, Protestant, loyalist, working-class uh, Belfast. 
and it was in, in a church uh, which I had deconsecrated. Do you understand what I mean by that? Uh, I'd taken away the consecration. And, and it was the best thing that I ever did because the community has taken over the church uh, yeah. under new leadership and owned the church. And I confirmed nine people in that little place where they're meeting. And they have to pretend they're not being church, you know. But there are more people there than who were doing there when the church was the church. You understand? And uh, in that confirmation, uh, uh, a Republican paramilitary was presented for confirmation by a loyalist paramilitary. That's the kind of thing that's happening uh, in Fresh Expressions. Uh, so church planting, fresh expressions are not multitudinous, but actually working quite well in the context of my own diocese. Can I just tell you, Drew, can I do a bit of liturgy with you? Uh, at this confirmation, uh, what happened was uh, on the screen at the front, everybody said why they wanted to be confirmed, and they recorded that. And then they stood at the front uh, beside the fire, which they gather around a fire, and the person presenting them for confirmation, their prayer partner, said to them where they saw God at work in their lives. Right, so, so a, a liturgy question, was on uh, one level very informal, but on another level actually much purer and better than a lot of the formal and stuff. And what you know? specific advice would you real. like to offer us as as we consider entering into a possible process of revision? Yes. Yes. Um, ooh, I, I, the first lesson that you learn in a church of our size, now you have a, a larger church, uh, but the, the first lesson you learn is that it's an awful lot of very, very hard work. Um, it's incredibly difficult work uh, for a small group of people to do, especially we have no employees or anything like that uh, in relation to it. Um, I think I would say that, that our call to create one book and a book where everything could be owned by everybody has been a call that has paid off. Uh, I think it's, the prayer book is a popular book. Uh, you'll notice in it that morning and evening prayer are one service. Uh, it's a very interesting thing. Most people don't know the back stories to these things. When the hymn book was created in the year 2000 and published by Oxford University Press, they said they were going to publish it in Bible paper, which would have made it quite a slim and tidy volume. But they didn't publish it in Bible paper. It appeared in other thicker, heavier paper which was a great disappointment to us and made the selling of the hymn book quite difficult because people found it very heavy. The reason why we have morning and evening prayer as one service is we were so exercised by the heaviness of the hymn book that we didn't want the prayer book to be heavy and we trimmed it at every possible point. Uh, but I don't think we would create morning and evening prayer as one service now if we were doing it. Uh, I think the other thing uh, that is clear about it is that, um, that any prayer book or any liturgy without the power of the Holy Spirit and the centrality of Christ and the gospel of Christ, uh, it, it's, it's a bare bones thing. It, it's, it, you know, it, doesn't, it, it will not create evangelism. It will not create vibrant churches in and of itself uh, and 
sometimes I think we thought if you change things to U form or if you modernize it a little bit, it, it'll make a lot of difference. Uh, I don't think that the creation of a new prayer book has made, in that sense, a great deal of difference uh, in terms of growing churches or vitalizing churches or revitalizing churches. Um, but I think it has provided an anchor point uh, for the Church of Ireland. And I think the new hymnody, uh, again, hymnody, hymn books uh, do not really affect churches that are very go-ahead because they will have whatever hymns they want on uh, bulletins or on screens or whatever it is, and they'll be up to date. But the, the value of the hymn books to us has been uh, really getting a wider and more creative repertoire of music into the, the more traditional type churches, uh, who once they see that something is an official hymn book of the church, uh, they engage with it. I, I, I'm going to say something which you probably can just go on to disagree with, uh, but I observe that in most of the hymn books that have been created in North America, and that doesn't include yours because yours is around for a while, uh, the, most of the hymn books that have been created uh, of late in North America take and mangle uh, hymns that were perfectly good. If you look at the Canadian ones, both the Anglican one and the United Church of Canada one, they mangle hymns that were perfectly good uh, and kind of ruin the resonances and the memories of them. And then a certain number of authors arise, some of which are good, but most of which are not, who create hymn, things that sound like hymns to fit uh, to right. metrical <laughs> tunes that people associate with hymns, but it becomes like moving wallpaper. Uh, there, there is not the link between the tune and the words Thank you for that uh, to touch people's hearts. Is that a good anyway. starter for 10? <laughs> Sorry, that's what they say in a quiz show here, a starter for 10, 10 points, right? Yeah. Well, we thank you very much for the time that you've given us um, this morning. Thank you for talking with us and sharing your insights and your... <laughs> Divi divided by a common language. <laughs> we're, we're very grateful to you for, for speaking with us today. It's a pleasure. I've lost you. Yeah. I've I've lost. Uh, yes. Well. Well, I thank you for thank ending you a little bit <coughs> early and for having this earlier than expected. My son Kevin uh, has an art exhibition in the thank Royal Hibernian much. Academy in Dublin. So I have to set off for Dublin for his art exhibition now. So thank you, and God bless you and your work. Bye. Bye. So, sorry, 